and welcome to our Equity Through Art series in partnership with San Mateo County Libraries and the BHRS Office of Diversity and Equity. We appreciate all of you being here. My name is Shereen malik Abzali, she, her pronouns, and I'm the Chief Equity Officer with the County of San Mateo. As part of our commitment to equity, we created this series to focus on race in San Mateo County through the lens of art. Through this series, we'll hear from BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities about their history and experiences living in the county. Understanding the history and lived experiences will help us better understand why we are here today, a county that has deep inequities by race, ethnicity. We hope you can join us for all the sessions as we each will highlight the story of a different community. If you miss any of the events, you will be able to find them at smcl.org. Thank you. Well, I wanna thank everybody again for, for coming and just briefly, um, this was a joint project by the San Mateo County Library and as well as the Tan Friend Assembly uh, Committee, which Steve Okamoto is an active member of, and also the Millbury Anti-Racist Coalition. There'll be more information about the, the three organizations that, that the library will be providing after this event. And so without further ado, let me turn it over to Steve Okamoto and let him address all of the questions that have been raised and any new ones. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I look forward to answering uh, the questions that were sent in via chat. And uh, Amy and uh, Darren will be uh, giving me the questions. We did have a few questions that came in earlier. One of the questions that came in uh, during the chat and beforehand was what sort of, it seems like advanced preparations were required to make this uh, space, to make this camp. Um, do you know about if, if things happened in advance of uh, people being interned or how that, those preparations were made? Yes. Um, by the way, I, I just want to say hi to my sister, Barbara. I see her watching, watching us. She's uh, tuning in from Hawaii. Hi, Barb. Uh, yes, uh, oh, most definitely. Uh, you don't get something as extensive as these, and I put in quotes, assembly centers. I'll talk about that later, as well as camps uh, in the spur of the moment. Uh, President Roosevelt and his group uh, for months and months prior to 1941 uh, were planning on doing something because uh, there were a lot of um, a lot of talk about the fact that Japan and U.S. were going to go to war. Uh, another byproduct of the camps was a, a group called the Military Intelligence Service (MIS). Uh, this was another uh, group that was put together because the government and the army knew that we were eventually going to war with Japan. So they needed some folks who would be good uh, translators, interrogators and whatnot. So all that happened in um, uh, way before 1941. Uh, Steve, can you hear me? It's Amy. Amy. Yes, yes, I can. So here's the question that came in prior to the film being shown. Uh, what happened to the Japanese Americans from Milbrae and adjacent cities after the war? Did they come back? What happened to any Japanese American owned farms in and around Milbrae? Did they get their land back and their farms back? Well, uh, it's impossible to determine who came back after the war. Um, but I can tell you that um, all properties that were left by the Japanese when they were sent to the camps. Uh, they were just confiscated by either the government or anybody that wanted to pay the property tax. Uh, we do have some wonderful stories, however, of uh, neighbors of uh, farmers and ranchers who would take care of that particular piece of property. And uh, when the war was over and the Japanese did return, they would then just go ahead and start farming again. But uh, in the vast majority of the cases, uh, people lost all their property. And Steve, we had um, 
someone who uh, thanks Diane Fukami and sponsors for producing this important documentary um, and recording these invaluable first person interviews. Um, and while we were watching, we did have someone ask if they confiscated the cameras uh, from the internees, where did all of the footage come and the, the camera work and images come uh, that we got to see in this film? Well, there were a variety of sources. Uh, the government did hire two professional photographers, um, uh, Dorothea Lang, and, and I can't remember the second one offhand, but uh, some of those images were taken by professional photographers. Also, there were some amateur photographers who brought, um, I guess they, you would say smuggled either cameras or lenses into the camps, and they would take photos. Uh, but then as time go went on, uh, after several months, the camp administration came to trust the internees. So they would allow them to, uh, you know, take photos and uh, mo movies. Uh, Steve, some comments came up and I wonder if you could address, it might fall under the heading of propaganda, but language like interned, evacuation, uh, the words that are used, even camp, um, what are your thoughts about the language that we've been taught to use when we're talking about imprisoning citizens? Uh, the government uh, during the war used a lot of euphemisms or words that were a lot softer than the real meanings. Uh, for example, um, evacuation. If you think about evacuation, well, they're evacuating people. But the terminology that we like to use nowadays is forced removal. As far as relocation, uh, it's incarceration into camps. Uh, assembly center is now called temporary detention centers. And probably the most interesting one is internment camps. Uh, the uh, camps that were located in the worst parts of the uh, United States. Uh, the common term is internment camps, but uh, believe it or not, during the war, the government actually used the words American concentration camps. And those are the words that we use today because that's what the government called them. But the most interesting and most fun, if you want to call that euphemism, is a newspaper article or excuse me, newspaper headline. And that headline said, aliens and non-aliens shipped to the interior. So if you look about that, uh, at that headline, okay, aliens and non-aliens ship. Wait a minute, what's, what's a non-alien? A non-alien is a citizen. So do you think the government would say citizens were shipped to the interior? I don't think so. So definitely there is a um, movement afoot, we call it power of words, that want to use the correct terminology uh, in today's uh, vernacular. We can't change what happened back then in terms of assembly center and, and camps, but uh, going forward, we are using the power of words uh, terminology. Thank you. We did have someone ask if there was a record of the men and women who were imprisoned at Tamfran, yet went on to serve in the war effort in the 100th and 442nd and MIS. Oh, oh I'm, I'm sure there definitely is. Um, because the uh, 442nd primarily, uh, they were recruited from uh, the internment camps, that is it was called back then, as well as uh, many, many from Hawaii, mostly from Hawaii. Um, we do have that record, and if you go to the archives in San Bruno or in Washington, D.C., uh, you can find those names. But uh, there were about 10,000 uh, 442nd boys. Thank you. Steve, a question came in through the chat asking about reparations being paid. Could you talk to us about that, please? Sure. Um, in the um, early 80s, the government decided to uh, really learn exactly what happened 
to the Japanese. So they formed a government commission. And that commission was the wartime, uh, uh, wartime something. Okay, I can't forget again. But it was a government commission that went all over the country. And they heard testi testimony from thousands of people, including my sister, Barbara. She um, uh, gave her testimony as to what happened to her and to our family. And as a result of that, this commission uh, came out with three answers to why the Japanese were incarcerated. One of them was wartime hysteria, which was pretty uh, obvious. The second one was racism. And the third was lack of political leadership. So as a result of that, um, Congress passed the um, uh, legislation in 1988 that allowed uh, those who were living and were incarcerated in any of the camps, which would include myself, my sister, and my father, uh, we received uh, $20,000 each. Now, that was a lot of money, yes, but in terms of actual dollar loss by everybody who lost all their property, it was minuscule. But what we did appreciate most was not the $20,000, but we all received a letter from back then uh, President Bush Sr. And that was the letter that actually apologized. And the first time the government ever apologized for something they did. So to most of us who have kept that letter, that was much more of a treasure than the check that we received. Thank you. Um, since you did bring up your experience a little bit, um, may I ask you to, to speak to your experience directly? And if that question is too general and too vague, perhaps you could share with us um, one of your favorite memories from that experience. And of course, one of your uh, least favorite or things that, that really stand, stood out for you to be a, a real issue. Well, uh, Tan Paran Racing, racetrack opened in um, uh, uh, April 30th, 1942. And um, my family, my sister, my father and mother, we went there um, a couple of days later. I was like five weeks old at the time. And we, as the film showed, we can only bring what we could carry. So you can just imagine, you know, my mom having to carry me, I was just an infant all the diapers and, and formula and bottles and whatnot. And my sister being three years old at the time, having to carry her little suitcase of dolls and clothes. So my dad had to carry heavy suitcases to Tan Foran. Now we were first housed in horse stalls. Most, uh, about half the folks who were at Tan Foran had to live in a horse stall because uh, they just did not build enough barracks at the time. And everybody, and especially my mom who told me later on, the only thing she remembered about Tan Foran was the smell of the manure and the urine, because there was no way that the government could clean out those horse stalls by just hosing them off, because those, the urine and the, and the uh, feces, they were embedded in the wood and in the cracks between the wood. So that's the only thing my mom remembered, the smell of the manure and the horse manure and the urine. And I apologize since, I mean, you were obviously very young at that time, wouldn't have your own memories, but have you actively attempted to collect memories from other people who uh, survived that experience and had that experience? And how have you, how have you tried to collect those if so? Um, earlier on, uh, probably 10 years ago, I started talking to a lot of uh, my friends here in San Mateo uh, because they were still alive. Now, most of them, if not all of them, have passed on. But I just wanted to hear from them because I've been somewhat of an activist on learning about and, and educating other people about what happened to the Japanese. 
Um, in the 70s, when I was with the uh, San Francisco JECL, uh, a fellow, a friend of mine on the uh, board at the time, Greg Marotani, he and I went and visited school teachers of the high school in San, in San Francisco. And we wanted to know, you know, what kind of education are you giving your students as to what happened to the Japanese? And they said, well, here's our history book. There's about a paragraph that tells our students what happened. So it was one of our goals to work with the um, Department of Education to get better education books, history books that told the whole story. Uh, even today, uh, or back then, it took a long, long time. But today, uh, there are a lot more stories, a lot more, a lot more information. As a matter of fact, um, the video that you viewed earlier, Tan Friend from Ray Track to Assembly Center, uh, the San Mateo JCL, we purchased, I can't remember how many from Diane Fukami, and we gave them to every middle school and high school in San Mateo County, because we felt it was very important that they have that kind of information. Um, the JACL, the National JACL, has an education component where we have uh, uh, teachers' material, we have teacher training. We need to educate all the teachers in high school and whatnot. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I do a lot of speaking uh, to high schools, to middle schools, to service clubs, to anybody I can, because it's vital that not only people learn about what happened to the Japanese, but we cannot let this happen again. And unfortunately, it has happened, especially in the southern borders. But this is one of my goals, is to be out there, teach, educate, and have people learn what happened. Uh, Steve, you mentioned the southern borders and um, in the, you know, prior to the event and the questions submitted and in the chat have been um, comments about what's going on at the border, the southern, our southern border, the southern border of this country with Mexico. And um, do you have any comments about that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, many of us, uh, not me because I was, I'm a little too old to travel that far, but many of us have gone down to, to, uh, to Texas mm -hmm. uh, where, believe it or not, there was a uh, prison called Crystal, uh, uh, Crystal, oh boy, my memory is gone, but uh, it was a uh, prison. And uh, the place where a lot of the folks who were arrested crossing the southern border, uh, very nearby, they're there. So we went down there to, uh, to I guess, uh, walk, you know, and uh, try and educate the government. Hey, wait a minute, you did this once before, you can't do this again. Um, Unfortunately, uh, you know, a lot of our efforts weren't very successful, but at least we did get a lot of uh, news time. Yeah, Crystal City Correctional Facility, thank you. That's my pleasure. Um, we did have someone um, who's wondering if those who instigated, planned, and wrote not in, uh, 9066 were ever named and are held accountable for, for, for this. Well, uh, Executive Order 9066 was uh, written by uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And many people have the misconception that that particular executive order gave the Army the authorization to round up Japanese. Uh, that is not technically correct. Uh, that just gave the Army the authority to remove people from uh, certain parts of um, California, Washington, Oregon, and Southern Arizona. Uh, but then they decided that those folks that needed to be removed were Japanese. So uh, that's, that was the whole start of what happened to the Japanese and how they were uh, rounded up 
and sent to these counts. So a, a question came through in the chat um, about uh, what happened to uh, people of Japanese descent in Hawaii and were they forced into any camps? And if not, why not? Well, there's several reasons, and I'm sure my uh, sister and niece, Wendy, who's also watching, probably have an opinion. But uh, one of the main reasons was economics. Uh, at that time in 1941, the uh, census of the state of Hawaii had 40% being Japanese. So if they rounded up 40% of the Japanese, the economy of Hawaii would just crumble. So that was one reason. The other reason is that uh, there was a group uh, that uh, met with the uh, FBI uh, prior to what was happening. And they said that, um, you know, let, let, let us identify those folks who uh, might be a problem and then the rest just let us be. So um, that allowed the uh, FBI to round up just a few, and I wouldn't say few, maybe 800 or so. Uh, but they were put into uh, camps in Hawaii. Uh, they were some sent to Texas and, and the mainland. And just about every island had a incarceration camp, but nowhere near the extent that happened here on the mainland. Thank you. And I believe we have time for one more question. Uh, I'm giving people a chance to try to submit them in the chat if they would like to. And if not, um, I, we, we would love to hear you speak to, um, you know, uh, knowing that uh, the generation of people who have survived this experience are, uh, we're losing them, unfortunately. And it's incredibly important to continue to share this information. Uh, what are ways beyond uh, interviewing our, you know, interviewing our elders, beyond creating these video stories and sharing them that you think uh, we can continue to work to help ensure uh, that these uh, types of things don't happen again? And, um, uh, possibly prior to that question, if you'd like to answer it, we did just get a question in. Um, why didn't the uh, Japanese Americans who were interned uh, complain after the war? <laughs> Thank you very much for that as well. Yeah, no, no, that, that's, oh, oh, hi, Anne. Anne's mirror of Milbray. Um, there was a really good reason why they didn't complain afterwards, uh, because during their incarceration, there's two Japanese words. One's a word, one's a, a phrase. And these two allowed the Japanese to cope with the horrid experiences that they went through. The first word is gaman, gaman. Gaman means to persevere. And that that's, says so much about how the Japanese were able to just you know, face all this crap that they had to endure. Come on, just persevere. But the second phrase that is as important is shikata ga nai. Shikata ga nai, tr loosely translated is, it can't be helped. So in other words, you know, hey, we're, cut in a, we're caught in a situation that we can't do anything about. So let's just make the best of it. As you heard in the uh, film, you know, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. So those are the reasons why um, you know, we were able to cope. Now afterwards, uh, in most cases, including my family, uh, we were never told and we, we never talked about what happened in the camps, whether or not, whether it was shame whether it was guilt, whether it was just, hey, you know, let's just forget it and go on. That was really, uh, really a strong motivation for us not really getting all upset. But then in the 70s, uh, as I said before, I, I became very active uh, and 
we said, you know, this is wrong. We, we need to right this wrong. And so we, we did a lot. We talked a lot. We met a lot of people. Um, the JACL uh, went and spoke in Congress. Uh, John Tataishi, who was the executive director of JCL at the time, met with Norm Mineta. Many of you remember uh, uh, Secretary Mineta. Uh, Senator Dan Inoue from Hawaii, Sparky Matsunaga. Uh, they all went to their uh, their colleagues in Congress, and they their approach wasn't. You know, we need to pass a law because the Japanese were wronged and we need to correct that. That wasn't what they did. The approach that they used was the Japanese, their, con their constitutional rights were abridged, their civil rights were taken away, their human rights were trampled. And because of that, they got enough support to pass the legislation that allowed the Japanese to get some sort of reparations. So I think um, those are probably the, uh, the underlying reasons why a lot of Japanese really weren't upset afterwards. But, Thank uh, you. Oh. Before we get the last question, um, I'd just like to make a couple of comments. First of, first of all, of course, I'd like to thank the Milbury Anti-Racist Coalition and the San Mateo County Libraries for putting on this program. Um, I also want to uh, give a big shout out to the producer, Diane Fukami. Uh, she is a wonderful documentarian, uh, has come out with many, many wonderful uh, programs. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is, um, as you mentioned in the uh, intro, I'm uh, involved with the Tancran Assembly Center Memorial Committee. We are putting together a memorial at Tancran, just outside the San Bruno Art Station, on the way up to the Tancran Shopping Center. Um, we are uh, very close to starting construction. We should have the um, whole thing completed early next year. And uh, we will have some sort of opening ceremony on or around April 28th, which was the um, which will be the 80th anniversary of when Tan Fran opened as an assembly center or a temporary detention center. So, if you are interested in learning more about the center and how you can support us, uh, we have a very simple website: tanfranmemorial.org tanfranmemorial.org. I urge you to check it out. So again, thank you. And if there is one last question. we I believe we did get one last question. Um, and we did actually have uh, several people talking about the the no-no boys um, and, and what that is. So if that's something that you'd like to speak about a little bit more or- I have, um, I have no problem speaking about it, but we don't have enough time. Okay, yes. <laughs> that, that is a very, very lengthy discussion. Um, I wish I did have time because the No No Boys, and I mentioned briefly about the MIS, the Military Intelligence Service, those are two very, very important discussions, as well as the 442nd. Those three are very, very important, but unfortunately, we don't have enough time. And if we ever do this again, uh, I'll be more than happy to discuss that. I was going to say, this seems like a, a great topic to approach um, in the future to, to devote additional time to that. Uh, I would love to say again uh, to everyone who joined us today, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Steve Okamoto, uh, thank you for generously donating your time to be a part of this and continuously doing so. Uh, your commitment to this is a real inspiration for everyone. Uh, if you have not all uh, looked at the Tamfran Assembly Center Memorial Committee, please use the links that you see in the chats to do that. Uh, you will also get a follow-up 
email in the uh, next week with a recording of this conversation and an opportunity to see this again and share it with others. We will ask you all to uh, please let us know how you felt about this event, uh, which could not have happened without the dedication of Amy Lauer and Steve Holm and the Millbrae Anti-Racist Coalition. Uh, they really, they brought this, they champion it, and it is wonderful to see what they're doing um, with and for their community. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. We really appreciate having you here and we look forward to seeing you at future San Mateo County Library.